I had a strange experience recently. It came on the heels of two television programs, of all things. The first one was a, a DVD I had sent off for, for and, and sat and watched. I thought it was about space. Well, it was. It's, the title of it was Hyperspace. And it had a segment in it that dealt with the end of whether or not humankind would ever survive. And, of course, the conclusion that I came to after watching it was, of course not. It's impossible. It's really striking how it showed that the Earth rotates around the sun in what they called a kind of a green belt, a very narrow strip in which the heat and light from the sun is perfect for the maintenance of life. But the sun is now and will, for whatever period of time it's there, will continue to get bigger and hotter. And that green belt will slowly move away from where we live our lives here. When that begins to happen, most of the stuff that worry us today to day won't worry us anymore. Of course, it won't be us. It's, we'll all be dead and gone by that time. And that's kind of cold comfort, but it's comfort, and it's better than none. But the earth and all the human beings on it will die. Scientists then speculated, well, what we can do is we can send some pre-colonization missions to Mars. We can maybe revamp Mars climate because it will start warming up. And then we can go ahead and develop and colonize Mars. We'll put a lot of spaceships out there. Humankind will survive. But then he pointed out the obvious, that when the green belt reaches Mars, the sun is still getting hotter and the green belt will eventually move away from Mars. I don't know. He speculated maybe we could go to Europa, a, a moon off of Saturn for a while, but the end of it all is the sun will die. And the pictures that were drawn of the way it happens here on Earth were just hurtling <laughs> as far as seeing what actually would happen. Well, you know, that was bad enough. Then... There was another thing that came up just a few nights ago on this uh, History Channel Mega Disasters series of programs that they've got. I didn't know about this one at all. I kind of knew that sooner or later the sun was going to burn out or die or blow up and, and, and everything is gone. I knew that from science. I didn't know the, the details that I learned from hyperspace. Then I learned the other night that there are these little things called binary stars out there in our galaxy that rotate round and round one another all the time, and they tend to get closer and closer until they collapse into one another. And the result is, from the mass, creates a, a huge black hole, sucks in all the matter around from both those stars, and it begins to spew out gamma rays from the two ends of the thing. If one of those spew outs of gamma rays hits the Earth, the first we will have any clue about it is a bright flash, like a giant flash bulb in the sky. Immediately, all the ozone layer will be destroyed. Ultraviolet light will come unimpeded to the surface of the planet. The atmosphere will turn brown, and over the course of the next following 10 years, you won't be able to grow any food. Animals will die off. The seas, all life in the seas will perish because of the loss of the food chain, from, starting with the plankton from the sun. And all this happens with no warning. It could happen Tomorrow. I didn't know that. I just knew that sooner or later we were going to wind up being in a lot of trouble. Now, both programs faced up to the end of human life. The first, as I said, postulated man might migrate to Mars, maybe to Europa, and then after that, the nearest star is four light years away, and there ain't no planets there. And how far we can go. God only, you know, we, we might colonize space in a space arc, but that's where people would grow old and die, maybe have children, who knows what they would do, but frankly, don't count on it. What made it a strange experience for me is that I found myself afterward in a strange melancholy. I thought, you know, why am I depressed by this thing? And I began to realize as I thought about it for a while, I, I knew how the story would end anyway. I knew humankind is not going to go on <clears throat> indefinitely anyway. So why am I here mourning the loss and the death of humankind? Well, I think there is something down inside of all of us. It's an instinct in man for the preservation of the species. 
and we make sacrifices for the preservation of the species. And facing up to the fact that it can't be preserved hits something down inside of us. At least it did me. Now, the reason none of this should, surprise, should have surprised me, the reason why it really shouldn't quite have affected me the way it did, was something Peter wrote a long time ago about these things with really surprising accuracy. It's in 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10. Peter said, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, the elements will melt with a fervent heat, the earth also and all the works that are therein will be burned up. I saw that graphically represented on a television screen, made my hair stand on end to realize how close what I was seeing was to what to precisely what Peter said here would happen. It's astonishing, really, in its, in its similarity to what science tells us is going to happen. It's not in doubt. We know it. How did Peter know this? You know, we know it today because of science. Everybody who studies it knows it. But how did he get it? What puzzled me about this was, you know, I'm fairly familiar with my Bible, and I could not think of a single Old Testament scripture that he would have looked at and said, oh, this tells me what this is going to happen. So I got my handy-dandy cross-references in and went charging around looking up every cross-reference, every marginal reference I could find in this passage of Peter. And I found some references in Isaiah, Micah, the Psalms, Joel, Malachi. Nothing, though, quite as accurate as Peter's description. So we can attribute it to divine you know, revelation. And we can attribute it also to Peter reading and knowing all those prophecies and kind of putting two and two together and seeing what is going to someday take place. He goes on to say then to you and me, seeing then that all these things will be dissolved. What kind of persons ought you to be in all holiness and godliness? And I kind of, you know, I think the place where this hit me the quickest and the hardest was in the latter of those two programs about the, the basic collapse of the whole human economy. And I sat there watching their descriptions of it and their graphic representations of it and thinking, who will care about Iran, Iraq, Jordan, uh, the United States, Canada, any worldly governments when that time comes? There will be an end to war. Everybody will be thoroughly concerned with how he's going to eat the next meal, the meal after that, and the meal after that. People will be dying all around us. We'll be worried about how we can get the bodies out of sight rather than about who we're going to go to war with or not go to war with. It will be to bring an end to all of that. So when we see that world out there ahead of us, the question Peter asks is vivid. What kind of a person should you be? And I can tell you right now categorically, there is no food storage program. There is no digging caves somewhere and planning to hide yourself. None of that is going to save your miserable hide when the day comes. Either Jesus Christ will save your hide or it's going to be lost. And therefore, the kind of person we are becomes crucial. Looking to and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. So, now, this is one thing in here that kind of makes you think. Looking for and hasting to the coming of the day of God. What's the hurry? I don't know that in the Greek word is uh, spudo, speedo. You know, it's, it's looking speedily to this. Why in the world would I be in a hurry to see this? Well, it's because of what comes afterward. The next verse says, verse 13, Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwells righteousness. Okay, so this is what we should be speeding toward. This is what we're anxious for. It's kind of hard to feel sanguine about what's going to be here between here and there. But when you really see what is there and you realize your way from here to there, 
It is something to look forward to and to want to happen. Isaiah spoke of the new heavens and the new earth. In chapter 65 of Isaiah, verse 17, he said, Behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered or come to mind. Looked at that and I thought, you know, I think that there was a time when some thought maybe the earth gets melted down and then after it's all over with, God reshapes the earth and we, we come, we repopulates it and redoes this earth. And that's not what it says. It says new heavens and a new earth, not the old earth remodeled. And the reason why I feel quite certain it's a new earth, not the old one, is that the heavens also are changed. How do you do that? Well, if you were to be moved, not all that far away, if we could move our planet over you know, four, four light years away, you would no longer see Polaris as the morning star. I'm sorry, as the, as the north star. You would no longer see many of the things that you see today in the night skies. The whole, all, the, all the constellations would be different. They'd all gone because we are now in another place, and for all we know, in another galaxy. After all, there are plenty of them out there for him to restart with us in a new place at a new time. So, new heavens, a new earth, everything is different. Now, the New Testament ends with this new beginning. It's out there. It's somewhere. And humankind will survive in that new heavens and new earth, not because we migrated in spaceships. We will survive utterly, totally transformed, even as the kind of thing being we are. In Revelation chapter 21, Revelation chapter 21, verse 1, I saw, said John, a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were gone. There was no more sea, and I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared like a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Look, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself shall be with them. And be their God. The tabernacle of God. I think the word in this context probably means his pavilion. But again, it's not a palace. It's not a permanent type of dwelling place. It's a tent. God's tabernacle. He will be with them. Be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. There shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying. Neither shall there be any more pain. For all the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. How much is all things? Seems to me it's just pretty all-encompassing. I'm just going to start over, said God. Everything new. And then he turned to John and said, Write. These words are faithful. So write them down. Now, today, we come <clears throat> to the end of the Holy Day season to what we call the last great day, what some call the eighth day, because their assumption is that yesterday was the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles, therefore it was the great day, and so forth. That's another subject for another day to talk about. But in any case, today is the end of the divine drama. God has a plan. He is working the plan. And these holy days seem to be the markers throughout that plan. So... This is what we, where we are. Now, I'll be the first to admit that there are as yet mysteries unsolved, mysteries to be revealed in rel relating to these days. And the command to proclaim them or preach them in their seasons, I take to be a license to keep right on digging in them to see what will emerge the next time I'm called upon to stand before you and talk about these days. Many years ago, this was when I was a very young minister, I was told categorically, that when you come to the holy days, you preach on the meaning of the days. Well, that rule was honored more in the breach by lots of guys, I think, down through the years. But I don't know. I, I took pretty good hold of that, and I've tried to stay with it and always stay thematic on these days because that's what God said. You proclaim them in their seasons. Okay. So to speak on them means you have got to try to be a little bit original, find a new idea here, a new idea there, dig a little deeper over there. And I've done this now for an awful lot of years. 
I, okay, this is my 49th feast, but uh, I wasn't speaking at the first couple of feasts. So I guess I've been speaking at about 47 Feast of Tabernacles in the last great days. I am really encouraged to know that my kind will survive even though in another higher form. But there are still some very large unanswered questions to deal with. In John chapter 7, verse 37, there's an interesting incident in Jesus' ministry. It's at the Feast of Tabernacles. In fact, it is in the last day, that great day of the feast, John 7, 37. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come to me and drink. He that believes on me, as the Scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke, John says, of the Spirit, which they who believe on him should receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Now this is really a, a fascinating statement that he makes here, and that he makes on this day. Any man comes to me. The disciples did not have this straight yet. In fact, they didn't get it straight for quite some time afterward because at this point in time, Jesus did not say any Jew that comes to me. He didn't say any Israelite that comes to me. He didn't say my people who come to me. He said any man, Jesus Christ, on this day threw the door open wide to the whole world, to everyone. Oh, it went to the Jew first, but then to the Greek and from there, it has gone to the whole world. Now, this, this, uh, this statement is, is fascinating by Jesus. He going on to say that, that rivers of living water that will flow out of us because of our belief in him is the Holy Spirit. Now, I take this to mean, essentially, not merely that you receive the Holy Spirit, but that the Holy Spirit flows out from you in this occasion that you actually become one who, who actually is a carrier, if you want to compare it to an epidemic, but you take, take along good infection, as C.S. Lewis called it, and you begin to infect others with that spirit that God has placed in you. Now, there is one thing that nearly everyone agrees on about who keeps the feasts. They, the festivals, each and all, have a distinct meaning for those people who observe them. I think they probably have... In fact, I'm quite certain they have more than one meaning. For one thing, for example, the Holy Days seem to have prophetic significance. You can approach them and discuss them in meaning relative to how they fit in a prophetic scheme. Then there is what, I'll introduce a new word to your vocabulary, soteriological significance. Soteriological comes from a Greek word that means salvation. It means they have salvation significance. Then there is also Christological significance. What this means is they have significance in relation to Jesus Christ and his ministry. Now, for the longest period of time in my own exposition of these holy days, I was wrapped up in the prophetic significance and would work my way through these uh, prophecies, or I mean, the, the prophecies connected with the holy days, as the way in which I went about explaining the, the meaning of them. And it was in, oh, it's probably 15, 20 years ago that it finally dawned on me that in the Feast of Tabernacles there is enormous Christological significance. And I was able at last, I felt, to finally see Christ in all of the Holy Days when I came to that. Now, there's probably more than that if we want to, you know, develop the ways in which we can look at these things. I don't believe for a moment that we have exhausted the meaning of the festivals. And so I'm hardly concerned with the fact that we differ on the subject. You may see it this way. He may see it that way. It's all right. Let's keep looking and let's keep talking. Who knows what God will reveal to us when all is said and done. I think this might be a good time to review the basic commands concerning this feast. <clears throat> In case you don't know where they are, it's Leviticus 23, verse 34. Leviticus 23, if you have your Bible, verse 34. Speak to the children of Israel and tell them this. The fifteenth day of the seventh month shall be the Feast of Tabernacles for seven days to the Lord. The first day shall be a holy convocation. You will do no servile work in it. 
Now, the distinction of servile work means you can do the necessary setup, take down, food preparation, and so forth to really rejoice in the holy day. But the kind of work you don't do is your job. You know, you don't go out mowing the grass. You don't go out there digging ditches. You don't go to work at some office somewhere and punch your computer. Your job goes aside. So no servile work is to be done. Now, the curious thing about this is it's a feast of seven days. You know what I'm saying? And we're here, if you've been counting, this is the eighth day that we've been keeping this feast. What's going on here? Well, a little later, verse 23, I'm sorry, verse 39. In the fifteenth day of the seventh month, when you've gathered in the fruit of the land, you shall keep a feast of the Lord seven days. On the first day there shall be a Sabbath, and on the eighth day there shall be a Sabbath. Now, that's interesting all by itself. First of all, it's a feast for seven days. Where do we get the eighth day? in this. I'll come back to that in a moment or two. You shall take to you on the first day the boughs of goodly trees, branches of palm trees, boughs of thick trees, willows of the book, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God seven days. Now, what most people take this to mean is that the Israelites went out and denuded all the trees around and, and had brush arbors. I remember distinctly, uh, some churches, you know, tried to follow this. I remember where my grandfather used to go to church, out way out in the country. There's no church building out there at all. But in the autumn, they had a revival. Not, well, it was about a mile and a half walk from his, his, his house across the fields and so forth. They had a revival in a brush arbor. I had never seen anything like that before. And you could smell the branches and all that were around you because they were beginning to dry up and give off their autumn smell. And they had little benches out there. And I remember in that church, they all would testify as to what God had done for them in the course of the year. And when the time came to pray... Everyone kneeled wherever they were around the brush arbor, and everybody prayed out loud. And that was really an experience for me as a very, very, very young fellow, kind of wide-eyed, watching and listening to all the praying that was going on in that little brush arbor. So I think it, the idea of this grew out of the Scripture, and they didn't really quite realize all the connections that were there. But they were trying. You shall keep it a feast of the Lord seven days in a year. It shall be a statute forever in all your generations. You celebrate it in the seventh month. You shall dwell in booths seven days. All that are Israelite born shall dwell in booths. So that they can remember that and know that I made the children of Israel to dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Now, I didn't mention earlier that there is also a Jewish historical meaning to the festivals. And what you see here is the historical and symbolic meaning of the Feast of Tabernacles for the Jews. So we go out and we build a booth, and by their own, you know, using common sense, they stop denuding all the trees. They make a little, little, a, little, a little booth, a little tent of sorts, sometimes on the balcony of their house. And they go out there and they sit under that during the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, so this is their concept of this. However... In Zechariah 14, I'm not going to go there to now just to mention it to you, we find the whole world keeping the feast, not just the Israelites. What would be the significance to the Egyptians of living in booths for seven days? None. And that's why the Scripture says it's for the Israelites born to live in tents for seven days, but for everyone to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. So here we've got a little problem to solve. And I've wrestled with it from time to time, uh, with greater or lesser success. Now here, but I come back to this question, which is it, seven or eight days? Well, opinions differ. I won't ask for a show of hands. Who thinks it's one way and who thinks it's another? And then who, which of you don't really mind, which is probably the largest group? The Hebrew uh, uh, idiom does this occasionally. I'll give you an example of it. It's a fairly familiar proverb. It's Proverbs 6, verse 16. You don't need to turn to it. I'll read it. These six things does the Lord hate. Yea, seven are an abomination to it. It is an idiomatic style of when you're coming up to a, a, a number, uh, in an important number like seven, you give it six things I hate. No, seven are an abomination. It's deliberate, and it's a way of emphasizing the total that is there. In favor of the eight-day eight, you know, eight festival is the Sabbath, which serves as bookends to the Feast of Tabernacles. So that you can see, perhaps, what he means was, you do this for seven days, yet you do it for eight days, 
as a means of emphasis. The days of unleavened bread are seven, are seven with the Sabbath at both ends and no eighth day. So the Sabbaths serve as bookends for the feast. In favor of a seven-day festival with an eighth day closing it out is that the people who speak the language and therefore could be expected to kind of understand what it means actually consider yesterday to be the last day, the last great day of the Feast of Tabernacles, and today being the eighth day, another feast. In case you missed it, some years ago I gave a sermon titled The Eighth Day, in which I charged off down that road for a ways to discuss where that might lead us. I understand also David Antion of Guardian Ministries also did a sermon titled The Eighth Day, which I haven't heard, so I don't know whether to recommend it or not, but I can recommend Dave Antion, so feel free to order it from him if you like. So maybe this day speaks to us about the new heaven and new earth, or maybe it speaks to the last events before that day. In anything, any case, I think a place to look is in the events in Revelation that took place just before the new heavens and the new earth, Revelation 20. Revelation 20 is really fascinating because it follows right on the heels of the appearance of the Son of Man in heaven on a white horse with, you know, a sharp sword that he's going bringing to smite his enemies. And here he comes to rule the world again. Revelation 20, verse 1, I saw an angel come down from heaven having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. He cast him into the bottomless pit, shut him up, and set a seal on him that he should deceive the nations no more until the thousand years are finished. Now, many people see this in the Day of Atonement, and this is the prophetic approach to these days. Feast of Trumpets, pictures the return of Christ. Day of Atonement, the binding of Satan. The Feast of Tabernacles pictures the millennium. That is the old prophetic symbolism that's been given to this particular time. On the other hand, if you look at it in a more soteriological way, that is salvation-oriented, the Day of Atonement takes on a whole new set of ideas and meanings, which I've spoken on that earlier. I won't go into it today. However, listen to what he says then. I saw thrones, plural, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given to them, and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark in their foreheads and their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Hence, we get our term, the millennium. And it's a strange thing we refer to that period of time as the millennium instead of the kingdom of God on earth, which is what it is, but never mind. The rest of the dead didn't live again until the thousand years are finished. This is the first resurrection. Now, John drops a bomb on us right there. When he says the first resurrection, he strongly implies that there is at least one more. Because not, you don't have the first of anything unless you've got something else that's going to follow on the heels of it. And if you chase the marginal references, which I did, and I, I was kind of surprised, this is not exactly a new idea. That many of the sermons, I mean, many of the scriptures that I would normally use in my sermon have for many years on this day are right in the margins of your Bible at this point, taking you back to them. Somebody, somewhere, uh, saw those scriptures as related to this. So, here it is. Now, this, here, there is this that comes from John, verse, chapter, chapter 5, verse 28. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the grave shall hear his voice. They will come forth. They that have done good to the resurrection of life, they that have done evil to the resurrection of life of damnation. But there's nothing in John about this being a first and second resurrection. These are separated not in time, but in kind. And there is still a problem back in Revelation 20, verse 6. Blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection. On such, the second death has no power. They shall be priests of God and of Christ and reign with him a thousand years. Now, what happens at the end of the thousand years? When the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. He'll go out and deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog. Gather them together to battle, the number of which is as the sand of the sea. 
And they went up on the breadth of the earth, compassed this camp of the saints about in the beloved city. Fire came down from heaven and devoured them. And the devil that deceived them was cast alive into the lake and fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet were cast, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. And he's got it coming. This is a strange sequence of events, and it really, in many ways, seems counterintuitive. How could this happen after a thousand years of Christ's rule? I want to think about this now. You visualize a thousand years in which Christ is king and is ruler with absolute power. Satan is out of the picture, bound, put away, not deceiving anybody. Okay, and we're there reigning with Christ. Uh, you've got ten cities you're taking care of. You've got five over here. You've got a couple. And we're all busily trying to teach people God's way around the world with the power to make it stick in many cases. How at the end of a thousand years of that, is there anybody left to fight God? Well, you know, it's a, it, it is kind of strange in a way. But you have to understand, I think, Whatever else may happen, whether Satan is bound or whether Satan is loose, man is still free to refuse God at all times. There is satanic evil in the world. There is also human evil. And it's hard for people to admit. It's hard for them to recognize. hard for them to accept. And at the end of a thousand years, there will be people who have seen us as nothing but an occupying army of another God and they will get their opportunity to fight back and surround us and die then comes verse 11 I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and heaven fled away and there was found no place for them I saw the dead small and great stand before God aha what, hap what, is it, what do you call it when the dead stand resurrection okay here we got another resurrection, so uh, the first resurrection now makes sense. The books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of the things written in the book according to their works. Now, what's fascinating about this is, and if you study your, your Bible carefully, you'll know this is true. Everyone today who is written in the Lamb's book of life, your name is in there, you will be in the first resurrection, or if you're alive when Christ comes back, at the same time that the saints are raised, you will be caught up with them to meet Christ in the air. The whole gaggle of us will go up at once. Everyone whose name is written in the book of life. Now here we are a thousand years later opening the book of life. We're not opening it to see who's in there. We're all, that's already been decided. The only reason I can see, and it took me a while to quite get this straight in my mind, the book of life is open to make new entries in the book of life. New entries made of those people who at the end of a thousand years are brought back up out of their graves, put back into the land, and given a chance to live. It's really a fascinating thing to consider. We think in terms of judgment, being called up and standing in front of the judge, he's behind the bench, you've got a couple of big light globes up here, and he's got a gavel in his hand, and we're reading out all the charges against us, the good and the bad of our lives, and he makes a decision. Some of us go to hell and some of us go to heaven. That's the old traditional way. But that's not how a prize fight is judged, is it? A prize fight is judged round by round as you fight. Did you? Are you keeping the rules? Are you fighting fair? Are you landing blows? Are you parrying the blows of the other fighter? And you're given points round by round throughout the fight. And a decision is reached after the judging, which goes on for a time. Now, there's been a lot of speculation about this time. It seems to come at the end of the millennium. Some speculated that it might be a hundred-year period. A uh, hundred years is as good as any. It might be more, might be less. Might be the last hundred years of the millennium. Might be tact. Who knows? It doesn't really matter very much. What matters is men who never had a chance to know God, more important, children who never had a chance to know God, now do have that opportunity. He then says in verse 14, Death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whoever was finally not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. 
Now, from this and other scriptures, we find put together an answer to a question which has troubled men from time immemorial. What is God going to do with all the people who never had a chance at salvation? Or let's be generous with people who had a chance and just blew it. Not mean-spiritedly, not viciously, not deliberately. They just dropped the ball. What about all these people? What is in, in store for them? Now, I've had some really interesting arguments on this over the years. Arden, they love to get, get after you on it. And I was talking with the husband of a lady one time, and I, I, I was really working him over on the question of what about all these people who never heard the name of Jesus? Because he agreed. He, he made the statement, I think, before I did, there's no other name given under heaven and earth whereby we must be saved. It's Jesus. I said, okay. What about the millions of people who never heard the name, never had a chance? And we went round and round. Finally, I got him backed into a corner. I drew a picture of him for him of all the little children who died and never knew and never had a chance to be saved. And his answer? If they never had a chance to be saved, they are saved. When I got my mouth closed again, I said, well, what are you doing with all the missionaries you're sending out? Giving them a chance to be lost? Most people have never been asked to face the absurdity that lies out there behind so many of their beliefs. If you follow them, if you ask, if you inquire, you don't have to really argue very much. Just keep on asking, looking for, you know, what, what is behind this? Now, the Catholics have a better answer, although it's totally without scriptural authority. But at least we can give them credit for trying. Purgatory. It's a place where if you didn't achieve salvation... You go to purgatory, where by whatever means of punishment you have to go through, uh, you learn to appreciate God and maybe have a chance then to achieve the beatific vision otherwise known as heaven. Now, when I was arguing with another woman about this issue, she finally got exasperated and said, Well, I just believe God will make a way for them to be saved. And I don't think she realized that at that moment she conceded my point. Because that is precisely what I have believed for years, that God will make a way. And I don't, you know, I don't want to stand before you and dogmatically, as I have in the past, but I won't do it today or again, surely. I'm not going to tell you that I have the answer. All I have is a possible answer as to how God will do it. I am as sure as I am standing here that it will look very different from what I imagined, but the result will be the same. People will come up out of their graves. They will be given a chance. They will be introduced to God. They will weep for the mistakes they have made and for the lost years and joyously accept God as their king and as their ruler. Here's our question. Has God, in his word, with the holy days, given us a clue as to what the answer to this question might be. I certainly think he has. Paul, now I won't go through this to belabor it today, but Romans 9 through 11, Paul himself wrestled with this. It drove him nuts. I don't think the Apostle Paul expected at all what happened when he went, hit that first missionary journey and began to go to synagogue after synagogue after synagogue. I think he probably went in there thinking that the Jews, when they heard that the Messiah had come, would stand up and cheer and go dancing in the streets, that they would accept Christ, you know, pell-mell. And when he got total rejection from the Jews and total acceptance from the God-fearing Gentiles, Paul was flattened. And for a long time he struggled with this. And Romans 9 through 11 is where the man exposes his innermost feelings to us and he explains to us how he wrestled with the question and how he found his way to the end, to the answer. And he said finally in chapter 11, verse 33, you know, or saying, oh, the depth and the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are and his ways past finding out. I, you know, I, I really wish I could tell you exactly what God is going to do, but I can sure tell you what the result will be. In faith, Paul followed the inexorable logic of Scripture, what he knew about God and what was happening on the ground. 
In the end, he said, all Israel will be saved. And he said it would be tantamount to life from the dead. I think he, through a glass, darkly realized that there had to be a resurrection involved for all the Jews who who had tried to stay true to their faith and had rejected Christ, thinking he was a false messiah. And that takes us back in the end of the book of Revelation. At the end of the thousand-year reign of Christ, there is another resurrection. All those people who never had a chance at being saved will be given a life to live. The book of life will be open for entries into the book of life. People will be judged day by day about how they live that life. And you may have the chance. You may be the one who can reach out to people whom you thought you would never see again and be the instrument of their salvation. When Paul wrote to the Romans, he was writing to the Gentiles, and he said, I want you to understand that sure enough, the the Jews, Israel has fallen. But actually, your faith, your work, can actually be the instrument for drawing the Israelites back. Now, how is this possible? Well, with God, all things are possible. But think about this as we conclude today. Of all the tombstones in the world, in all the graveyards of the world, all the family members that you've lost and sometimes gone out day, week after week, putting flowers on the grave. If you have one tombstone where you can be sitting when the moment comes, when the earth shakes and the earth parts and people come up out of their graves, whose tombstone do you want to be sitting on?